Thank you for patiently waiting. Good evening, everyone. This is Adiba Mehvish, and I welcome you all to bookmarks and world word enthusiasts yet again. Gather around for a momentous occasion. Let us raise our metaphorical pens and ink filled glasses to celebrate the incredible assembly of minds that has taken place within the hallowed halls of Raleigh Literary Society. Oh, what a magical symphony of knowledge and Im imagination we have just witnessed. As we bid adieu to this grand conference, we find ourselves teeming with gratitude, overwhelmed by the sheer brilliance and insatiable curiosity that each and every one of you has brought to this gathering. The air crackled with literary electricity as you, our magnificent audience, took a front row seat on this literary roller coaster of emotions and ideas. We bow to your unwavering dedication and thirst for knowledge, for staying by our side through thick times and thin pages. From poetry to prose, from dribbling plots to soaring sonnets, your keen interest and unwavering attention turned mere words into vivid tapestries of imagination. Through Rally Literary Society, let it be known that we are forever indebted to this vibrant congregation of minds. With grateful hearts and ink stained fingertips, we offer our sincerest appreciation for the unwavering support you have shown. As the final chapter of this conference closes, we take solace in knowing that the echoes of our shared literary journey will reverberate through the annals of time. So let us raise a final toast with the splendor of a keynote addressed by Abhinanda Chakraborty, ma'am. Ladies and gentlemen, esteemed colleagues and fellow seekers of knowledge, it is with great pleasure and admiration that I introduce you the brilliant Abhinanda Chakraborty, ma'am an exceptional assistant professor whose intellectual power shines like a guiding star in the academic grid. Prepare to be enthralled by her remarkable achievements and the invaluable insights she'll bring on the table on the captivating topic of trauma, memory, and post-memory. Mm -hmm. In the realm of academia, Abhinanda uh -huh. Ma'am stands as a true luminary with a resplendent track record adorned with numerous accolades and accomplishments. Her dedication and unwavering commitment to her field has not gone unnoticed, as evidenced by the prestigious Jyotish Chandra Roy Memorial Prize and Satish Rajan Banerjee Memorial Prize. Because the recognition bestowed upon only the most exceptional scholars, these honors serve as a testament to Abhinanda Ma'am's unwavering pursuit of excellence and her exceptional contributions to the field of study. The intellectual contributions of MAM extends far beyond more mere accolades as they have left an indelible mark on the world of scholarships. Through her insightful research and profound perspectives, her name graces the pages of renowned journals, her words etched like strokes of billions upon the canvas of academia. With each paper she has published, she has illuminated the field with her acute observations and groundbreaking ideas, inspiring fellow researchers and shaping the discourse around trauma, memory, and post-memory. Furthermore, Ma'am's insatiable quest for knowledge has led her to participate in a multitude of national and international conferences, where her presence has been a testament to her dedication to the pursuit of understanding. Her contributions in these academic gatherings have undoubtedly enriched the discourse surrounding their chosen field, leaving an undeniable impression upon the minds of fellow scholars. As we embark on this enlightening journey through the depths of trauma, memory, and post-memory, Abhinanda Chakraborty Ma'am's invaluable insights will undoubtedly prove to be a guiding light, illuminating the path of understanding with their profound knowledge, intellectual acumen, and unwavering passion, Abhinanda Ma'am is supposed to offer us a unique perspective that will expand our horizon and enrich our understanding of this complex and vital subject. Let us embrace this opportunity to learn from one of the brightest minds in academia as Abhinanda Chakraborty Ma'am shares her invaluable insights and leaves an indelible imprint on our intellectual landscape. We are honored to invite you as the keynote speaker at this conference on trauma memory and post memory. With your exceptional achievements and profound interest, we await your valuable contributions to enrich our intellectual discourse. With that, I would like to invite Abhinanda Ma'am to enlighten us with the words. Ma'am, please. Thank you so much for um, giving me this platform to speak. But uh, Adiba, 
I think I must admit that you have made me extremely nervous because I do not consider myself at all worthy of any of the things you have just <laughs> said regarding me. Uh, I, I do not claim to have any of those accolades. I do not claim to have any of those feathers in my hat. It was very, very kind of you, but and um, I do not know if I can add anything extraordinary to uh, an already extraordinary event, but I will uh, try to um, make maybe a few statements and if at all they can add anything to the already enriched uh, conversations that have taken place today, I would be more than honored to have been a part of this. So thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, and I will also try not to take up too much of time because I'm sure everybody's had had a very long day and there have been uh, brilliant uh, paper present papers presented, although I could not be uh, too much of a part of it, I, I literally had to travel 150 kilometers to make it here on time, which I did not think I'd be able to. Um, so without wasting any more time, I'd just uh, like to say a few things. Um, one, I think uh, I must begin by stating that uh, the very topic that has been chosen uh, for this uh, conference, um, I, I think that uh, is truly uh, noteworthy. It is truly praiseworthy because, uh, you know, memory and trauma and post memory, you, you know, these are very important topics in academia today. And uh, the very fact that this has been kept exclusively for the students, which, you know, to mark their involvement, that also is, um, is, is praiseworthy. And I think an institute like AMU is more than capable of hosting something so brilliant. I have myself, uh, you know, been associated with AMU on multiple occasions, and, and it is absolutely uh, my honor to be uh, speaking here. Um, I think uh, the part that I would like to focus on today in this very brief, uh, you know, uh, talk that I'd like to um, put here uh, is um, the idea, you know, it, it came into my mind while I was listening to, uh, you know, many of the lectures by Marion Hirsch. And, uh, you know, uh, she has figured prominently in the concept note and, you know, in many of the papers that have been talked about. And um, at one point in one of her lectures, she talks about Michel Foucault and Michel Foucault's concept of counter memory. Now, this is the part that I would like to talk about. In many of my papers, in many of uh, the works that I have done so far, I have actually dealt with memory. And I have um, studied the interface between memory and um, narrative and identity, especially between memory and identity. And uh, the part that I would like to highlight here is that uh, the field of cultural geography and the associated field of psychogeography, in these two fields, memory figures very prominently. Uh, so cultural geography would, of course, involve the analysis, the study, the examination of uh, the evolution of human culture as it is embedded in space and psychogeography, as the name suggests, uh, it is also one of the most emergent fields right now. Um, it basically deals with the interface between uh, the human psychology on the one hand and um, the surrounding physical environment on the other. And in both these associated fields, what we find common is this common obsession with memory. Why that is so? Because when we are formulating cultural memory, we are looking at collective memories. And again, this is a trope that Marion Hirsch is talking about, that Michel Foucault is also talking about. And in all of these thinkers, in all of these um, ideas, we have the common ground where all these collective ideas are being embedded in space, in, in, in bodies that are themselves embedded in that particular space. And uh, while I was doing a post-colonial analysis, uh, you know, looked at through the lens of psychogeography, there was something very interesting that I found. Uh, and here I will uh, refer to one of the most, uh, you know, uh, you know, popular writers, one of one of the very beloved writers was Ruskin Bond. And I would like to you know, state an example here that, uh, you know, Ruskin Bond himself, he has lived through both the pre-independent and the post-independent, uh, you know, eras of, of uh, 
of India. And while he lives through them, he talks about, in, in many of his later works, he talks about how um, while in post-independent India, the history books were being written while the discourses, the political discourses were being made, there was this concerted effort, obviously, uh, towards consolidating the uh, Indianized uh, you know, sensibilities. And, and there was, of course, a very uh, anti-colonial um, sentiment that was floating around, which is very, very natural. Otherwise, nationalism uh, would not have come to the forefront. But um, while we were looking at the partition, again, which which created trauma, and, and we have had uh, n number of authors, endless number of authors who have talked about the trauma, you know, from Sadato Senmanto to, uh, you know, the later writers like Amitav Ghosh and the others, uh, for example, in Shadow Lines, they're again and again talking about the trauma that has been embodied, you know, in the bodies and the space. Uh, but you know, a very interesting counterpoint that I have found in the work of Ruskin Bond is that uh, while we were busy looking at the Hindu and the Muslim victims of the partition, uh, he speaks of how, you know, there were um, British families during this uh, time of the partition. Uh, there were Anglo-Indian families who were as much victims of this trauma, who were as much victims of this, uh, you know, uh, displacement, as it were. Uh, and uh, he refers to, uh, I, I remember in, in one uh, of his books, he refers, and, and this is not fiction, he's referring to history here. Uh, he talks about how there is a kabariwala who is white and this person during the event of the partition is entirely left without any family he is left without any members he, he's left without any friends and he is forced to sleep in uh you know a a, a, a a completely worn down cottage which one of the uh, you know muslim uh, friends uh, lets him sleep in and counterpointed to this again he speaks of another british couple who were found dead in their cottage a few days after the event of the partition who had actually died of starvation and there are all these people he talks about who had lived in Missouri, in and around Missouri, in and around lander and these you know the reason he points them out and the reason i point them out today here in this uh you know platform is because these are not fictional characters they were real uh you know flesh and blood people and yet they were people who find no representation in the history books these are people who have literally, quite literally, passed through the fissures of history. And what history am I talking about at this point? The more uh, your textbook kind of history, the kind of versions of history that we would perhaps refer to, uh, you know, as meta narratives. You know, uh, you know, the, the ones that more um, affiliate to hegemonic discourses, because they, these kinds of meta narratives and histories, they always have some kind of a political agenda or the other, and we do not find representations we similarly during the trauma of the partition during the event of the partition you know there are people you know since we do talk about post memory and which is why i've brought brought in here the reference of ruskin bond because he's someone who was a schoolboy and he has lived through the experience of the partition and he remembers he recounts you know again quote unquote remembers recounts how uh, the muslims and the hindus who even had differences mutual differences uh, immediately before before the partition or immediately during the partition and while you know they were students many of them were children he recounts and yet who, who were not really aware of the entire political agenda that was behind this partition this event and yet uh, when the partition actually took place and all the muslim children were being shifted from these uh, you know schools from these typically british uh, schools like bishop cotton school and so on uh, you know how it was the muslim drivers and the and the hindu cooks how they came forward you know all these proletariat as it were and help these children uh you know reach safely cross the border or reach wherever they would be safe and these are stories of solidarity that we do not generally uh, know and uh, i think another point that um, that could be relevant here is that um, you know, when we talk about the theories of, of, of memory, um, there is a particular study um, 
uh, you know where uh, the you know the uh, the theory states that if we were to take uh, human memory and uh, study in in depth, then it could be divided into the long term and the short term memories. And these long term memories, if you were to divide them further, uh, if you subdivide them even further, there would be the point where we would be branching off between the semantic memories and, uh, you know, the episodic memories. Now, these episodic memories are where we are fundamentally possessing memories of people, possessing memories of places, of experiences that we have personally encountered. And these remain embedded for very long in our minds. On the other hand, we have the semantic memories, which derive from these episodic memories. And these, in turn, are divided into two categories one where we know facts about ourselves and the other where we have uh you know traits the knowledge of the self right so if i were to talk about the semantic self uh self facts it would be the fact that you know i am so this is my name and this is how old i am this is where i live now these facts are stored in one part of the memory while the knowledge that i am experiencing this or these are the people i have known these are the experiences i have had you know um, you know regarding my identity these would be stored in the episodic nature and i think uh, this is the point where the study of memory the theories of memory and the study of say cultural geography or psychogeography would come together because when we look at ruskin bond or when we look at these stories of trauma of post trauma it is very interesting that we have not experienced these traumas ourselves as marian hash uh, talks about when she talks about post memory so basically these are episodic memories of of parents of grandparents who have gone through these but when they hand these memories down, we process them in such a manner that they become part and parcel of our semantic memories and they become part and parcel of who we recognize as ourselves. They become part of quote unquote our self. And yet these micro narratives, as it were, they sometimes they would uh, affiliate to the meta narratives that are floated out there and sometimes they would clash with the memories that you know are out there collectively and i think this is where foucault or you know any of these uh, you know um, you know thinkers would come in that micro narratives i think at the end of the day you know as carriers of memory is extremely important why because memories offer if not anything else the very fact you know that we remember it offers a resistance against uh, oblivion it offers us a resistance and if we do not forget if we do not sink into oblivion if we can remember it uh, enables us to resist through our micro narratives, the meta narratives that, uh, you know, the hegemonic forces are always trying to impose upon us, which is where our personal, uh, you know, memories, our personal experiences, and those that are more familial, uh, you know, they must come together, blend together in order to form our micro narratives that would enable us to go beyond the meta narratives in order to be able to create these parallel histories. And, and I, I think this is something that was covered in one of the, um, you know, um, sub themes of this particular uh, conference today, that his that memory as parallel to history, memory as offering a parallel history. And that is why whether whether it be the memory of uh, the appetite in South Africa, whether it be the memory of the blacks, uh, you know, in America, the slaves, whether it be the memory of the partition, whether it be the memory of the Holocaust. But it is not important if we have ourselves experienced it or not. But it is important to remember and to pass these on to the future generations so that, and especially as I insist on the micro narratives, so that we do not forget, so that we do not end up as a culture, as a collective, affiliating to these meta narratives that 
are once again politicized that would always become weapons and tools in the hands of the powers that be no it is very important that we maintain the counter hegemonies that we maintain the counter narratives the counter memory so that we can resist and as long as we resist the individual will continue to be and 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 so that we do not risk falling into oblivion so that would be a very brief presentation that that would be it thank you so much thank you thank you so much Juna. thank you for gracing our conference with your awe-inspiring speech on trauma memory and post memory your profound insights and exceptional delivery left us mesmerized and enriched our understanding on the subject. We are immensely grateful for your valuable contribution. Uh, with that, I would like to invite Aisha Munira, ma'am, who is who has been teaching graduate and postgraduate courses in English and ELT uh, since ages now in the Department of English, AMU. Uh, with that, I would like to call Aisha, ma'am. Ma'am, please. Am I supposed Aisha, to speak right now? Hello? Uh, yes, ma'am. <laughs> please add uh, some points uh, on the conference, on the theme of the conference. Okay, I just shared a session and there I had uh, talked about a few things. Uh, indeed, it was a very good presentation or talk by uh, Professor Abhinanda. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, let me first thank the chair, uh, Professor Asim Siddiqui, and the organizers, uh, Abdullah, Utkarsh, Sharmeen, Adiba, and all others. You have done a wonderful job. It's, a, it's indeed a very important topic on which you have held this seminar, and that to a seminar for students. We in the previous century that is the 20th century that we have left behind but still it's continuing in various themes such as uh, memory trauma and uh, i would also like to connect uh, these two words uh, these two terms with literature and literary representations of memory and trauma uh, these uh, two words became very important and they were theorized in the previous century due to three uh, factors which I have already mentioned in the session I chaired. Just to make it very simple for the students, let me tell you that uh, you know the factors, why they became important, but you should be able to relate them with each other. So the first factor, the first important reason why memory, trauma and memory became uh, important um, uh, issues that uh, were theorized in the 20th century. Number one, due to the fact that Freud was there, obviously, and uh, Freud's uh, psychoanalysis and how he tried to, in the Western world, I would say in the West, uh, the unconscious was discovered, or at least it was uh, discussed and was made to be a part of uh, discussion and uh, understanding of human mind. So I won't say that in the non-Western world, that is the East, this concept wasn't there. It was there. But in the West, for the first time, we see that unconscious is being discussed. And sessions of uh, psychotherapy uh, are done, experimented with, uh, so far as Freud is concerned. And he is a person who looked at uh, human psychology as something that could be treated clinically and through talks. So psychoanalysis is in an important uh, uh, development. Number two, we know how the 20th century was fraught with so in the Western world, it was fraught with wars. We discovered that uh, the Western pretension of uh, uh, civilization was totally debunked due to the fact that two very gory, bloody wars were waged, killing millions of people. And after that, also people were traumatized. A very classical example we have in Mrs. Dalloway by Virginia Woolf, 
you know, one character who finally commits suicide. Mrs. Dalloway, who is well adapted, though quite all the time perturbed inside uh, her mind, in her mind, she is well adapted to the bourgeois society she's a part of. As a woman, she suffers more because she has to suppress herself more. But she is the witness, uh, or perhaps it's a kind of what to say? It's something that happens in her psychology. She witnesses a person suffering from PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, committing suicide. And then this is the second point you need to remember, keep in mind, in order to understand why these terms became important. And the third one is there were certain laws. Foucault talks about this, that uh, what happens uh, when violence doesn't work or when violence has to be substituted with something violence is encoded i'm not able to recall the exact words but violence is encoded in form of uh, laws norms and rules of the society so legalization or encoding um, rules and norms of the civilized world in form of laws also is a kind of um, act of violence because it tries to have violence somehow inside. So this is how he looks at uh, uh, legal rules that are impo imposed on uh, people, individuals in the society. So these three points we need to remember to understand why memory, why trauma during the 20th century and still these uh, issues are important these uh, in the 21st century since we know that all the time uh, the danger the peril of uh, a nuclear disaster is lurking and we have come very close to uh, many times you've come close to you know according to the doomsday clock which you can google and find out what it is we have come close to the brink of new a, new, a nuclear disaster in the world. You know what's going on. We know that the superpowers in the world, those who rule the world, have access to nuclear weapons, and uh, we are all the time somehow risk at uh, sitting at a risk. It's like sitting on a volcano all the time and thinking that some psychos may not let somehow or push some buttons and let all the, you know violence that is being suppressed out and which will kill the entire wipe out more than half the humanity so these terms remain important so far as what uh, dr professor abhinanda has said it was really interesting to see how she looked at uh, meta narratives and uh, 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 counter narratives uh, being very important micro narratives or micro uh, smaller individual level examples or experiences being some kind of counter uh, experiences that may not let uh, grand narratives to establish. So when grand narratives, or if I, I shouldn't be using the term grand narratives here, rather mainstream narratives are being established, which may uh, create or rather, which may fabricate, create slash, fabricate some memories that may or may not about uh, things or mm, uh, I mean happenings in the past which may or may not have occurred it's very important to counter such narratives mainstream discursive practices with micro uh, narratives uh, micro narratives in this re in this uh, matter becomes an important become an important tool to defy uh, mainstream narratives be, being imposed on individuals by the society. So when big narratives are woven and uh, thrown in form of literary and cultural productions on individuals and they invade individual memories, human psychology, it's very important for individuals to remember that we do not have to succumb to the pressure of uh, that kind of uh, imposition we have to think distance ourselves from what is being told to us and what we think uh, might have happened the and there is always 
it's a very good way of disconnecting ourselves from or or breaking a very what to say a vicious kind of cycle and uh, some kind of toxicity to continue in order to break it in order to break that kind of vicious cycle it's important to break free from trauma and uh, in order to break free from trauma of the past it's important to uh, assume some kind of disinterestedness and use some micro narrative to challenge what's being imposed what is imposed by us externally by the power that be so perhaps i was able to get what you said uh, abhinanda thank you so much for joining us and thanks everyone here there are so many aspects that we can discuss but others are also waiting and uh, thanks for giving me this opportunity uh, thank you very much thank you thank you so much ma'am for highlighting why taking up this theme of trauma memory and post memory was so important and uh, thank you for adding your views in this gathering and captivating us with your inputs and uh, following this i would like to invite a secretary abdullah parvez bhai who has been the backbone and the flesh and skin of rural literary society bhai i would like you to add a few words before we conclude the session uh, bhai please Uh, thank you so much. I just wanted to take this time and uh, let everyone know that Abhinanda ma'am has uh, gone through a lot of difficulties uh, to be here. Uh, I mean, we have, uh, uh, first of all, I just uh, informed uh, this to her uh, uh, last night. And uh, obviously she was not skeptical at all to do this. Uh, her situation uh, where she lives and what uh, the prior engagement she had almost made it seem that it would be impossible i think uh, uh, I, I was, uh, the last moments uh, through which she got here and uh, i was just able to imagine that she was going through traffic and there was rain and thunder and everything and then she has uh, made it here i think uh, uh, a whole traumatic <laughs> experience uh, which has resulted into not something that uh, hopefully that would be a trauma but something that is counter uh, to the trauma that might have uh, just uh, gone through the day uh, so thank you, ma'am, for coming in. And uh, right now we had here with us uh, senior professor, uh, Professor Aisha Munira, ma'am. And we have uh, traffic narratives. Yes, of course. <laughs> thank you. Uh, we also have uh, with us our other chairs, uh, Dr. Sunish uh, Sharma uh, from the Department of English as well, who, uh, Dr. Lubna Irfan from the Department of History, Dr. Sara Javed uh, from the Department of Psychology. Uh, we have Dr. Alisha Ipkar, who's also from the Department of English, among others. Uh, who've joined in, and of course, uh, we have uh, presenters from across India. Uh, Ma'am, thank you for joining. This was the first rendition of the student conference that we had this time. And this was a monumental step for us because uh, uh, to have a national interdisciplinary conference uh, from the Department of English that is wholly student organized and uh, that is catering only to UG and PG students was something that. Uh, was planned for quite some time and we did not expect the response rate that we got. Uh, having more than 30 universities across India participating in the first rendition uh, was absolutely unfathomable and uh, I mean beyond thrilling. Uh, uh, where we thought this conference might have just taken uh, a couple of hours because that was the expectation we had. Uh, this uh, had an expanse of over seven hours today. And uh, it has involved the effort of every member uh, here. Uh, and the whole uh, actually even was supposed to take uh, offline. And I hope it will. Uh, due to some administrative issues, we had to shift everything to, uh, to the online mode this time. But when we do have it, uh, uh, I hope that we can invite you on campus and have uh, a speech of some sort uh, delivered from your end uh, while on campus. And uh, I can also see how Professor Mohibul Haq Saab, who is uh, through whom uh, you have been recommended, uh, is never wrong uh, in the people that he uh, recommends and has the eye for. And uh, thank you, ma'am, uh, uh, for being here uh, uh, and taking out the time from all the engagements and all the uh, problems that you had to face. Thank you so much. This has been more than a favor upon me and the society, and it has also been an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. The, the honor and the pleasure are both mine. Thank you so much uh, to have invited me to be a part of something so spectacular. Thank you, and I wish you all the best for the other two days of the program. And, and I hope to be able to be a part of it later as well. Thank you. Thank you. May I also mention that Professor Mohibul Ha, Mohibai had mentioned you to me once, I remember well. So he thinks very high of you. 
Oh my God, I am absolutely honored. I I think of it. I think very highly of him too. And I'm absolutely, you know, when he texted me that, you know, I've recommended your name, and I was like, it was like 22 hours in hand, and I was, like I said, 150 kilometers away. I did not think I'd be able to make it. There was rain and storm and thunder. You know, I literally arrived like the witches in Macbeth. I literally did. I at one point of time, I did feel like one, or I thought I'd need some magical, you know, powers to be able to reach on time. But I did, and and I am so thankful to him uh, to have recommended my name to be a part of something like this. Thank you again. I'm, I'm absolutely honored. Um, thank you so much, Bhai. Uh, thank you so much, Bhai, for uh, you know telling us what all it takes to conduct uh, an event. And indeed, it is, a, it is actually difficult to gather such intellectual heads at one single place under a single banner. But I guess this is what makes Royal Literary Society stand out, as we are able to conduct things and execute such events despite of the hardship that come our way. So thank you so much, Abhinandan, ma'am, uh, for uh, you know crossing all that uh, difficulties in uh, being here among us. With that, we'll move towards the conclusion of day one of the festival. Our dear audience, may your bookshelves be forever filled with enchanting tales and may the magic of words continue to ignite your hearts and minds. Until we meet tomorrow, let the adventures of literature guide you through the pages of life. Thank you to all the presenters who presented the papers and different discourses and to all the attendees who were presence uh, who marked their presence and made this conference a blast thank you everyone for being such a wonderful audience i look forward to meet you all tomorrow in the captivating panel discussion we have planned on the day two of royal literary society thank you everyone once again on a high note and the same enthusiasm i bid farewell today only with the promise that we'll meet tomorrow in the panel in the same numbers and with the same excitement take care everyone thank you thank you for joining us